Welcome to NSTA Podcast. In this segment, Tina Grosser will talk about pattern and mechanism. There's three really big ideas in here. The idea that causes generate observable patterns, the distinctions between correlation and causation, and probabilistic causation. And these introduce different issues at different ages. So let's, let's look at each one. Um, but we're going to look at it through two big ideas in causal learning. And that is that when we talk about causal reasoning, we're talking about both how students reason about causal patterns and causal mechanisms. So when I say pattern here, I mean something a little bit different than what Kristen may have shared with the group last time when she talked about descriptive patterns. Here we're talking about patterns of impact. So let me give you some examples. So causal patterns refer to how the impacts unfold. And one of the things that we find in the research is that often kids come to us with fairly simple ideas about causal patterns. They may have very simple linear notions, um, but yet the phenomenon that they're trying to explain may have an extended linear pattern. It might be more domino-like. Perhaps it's a mutual causation. We often see these in biology in instances of symbiosis and parasitism, um, commensalism. It may be a cyclic kind of pattern. And by that, I don't mean simply a cycle. I don't mean something like the seasons, but I mean a cyclic pattern where one thing causes another thing causes another thing, and they continue in a repeating cycle of causality. Um, similarly, spiraling might be another example, where um, you actually have an escalation of impact, but it's also a form of cyclic causality. Another that's quite common, and we'll talk, I'll show you some examples of it as well a little later, um, is a relational causality, where you actually have two variables, and the relationship between those two variables leads to an outcome. Now, there may well be others. These are, are ones that we've researched and worked um, with students around for a number of years and investigated how they impact their science understanding. Um, but often, we encourage sort of a simple, not, not we, but, but in the world, um, students walk away with a simple linear notion of causality. And earlier, I said something about the way that um, cause and effect is framed in the standards. I think that one of my concerns about framing it as cause and effect is that it reinforces that simple linear notion that they have a temporal relationship. One happens before the other, and then you're done. So one of the things in talking about causality is that we need to be a little careful not to reduce causal patterns to this simple linear notion. The other part that researchers talk about is about the words causal mechanism. And so I'm going to invite you to stop and think about what that means. This session you know, talks about causal mechanism and explanation. I'm going to talk a little bit about how it fits with pattern in a few moments. But I want to give you a chance to just stop and think, what, does, what do those words mean to you, particularly you know, in terms of your classroom? All right, so if causal pattern is how impacts unfold, when we're talking about causal mechanism, here we're talking about what makes the processes or events happen. And um, I've chosen on this slide to use the words processes or events. A concern I mentioned earlier for the K-2 um, performance expectation is that it focuses very much on events. The reason that feels like a concern is because events are attention grabbing. They tend to get us to notice them. In the sciences, that can be a little bit of a problem because often processes are the, are the background sort of status quo. They're things that are going on much of the time. And one of the things we want to avoid is encouraging students to think about cause and event Cause and, cause and effect, I'm sorry, as only being event-like. We ultimately want them to, to attend to processes and events um, as they think about steady states, processes, and changes over time, which are other concepts in the, in the standards. 
the choice to say events, I don't, I don't know that I totally, you know, I, I think there's, there's reasons to do that. I think it's simplifying for the grade level. But at the same time, there are many places in the standards where what the kids are actually doing focuses on a process. So I, I don't think it's absent from the standards. I think it's just a choice in terms of language. Um, but let's look at mechanism for a few moments. So mechanism is what's making the process or the event happen. And it can be described at different levels. So if you think about the current in a simple circuit and what makes it flow, flipping a switch can. It could be that it's opening a circuit and allowing current to flow. You might explain the mechanism in terms of voltage creating a push from the battery and that that pushes electrons along a circuit. Another mechanism that you might use to explain it at a different level might be the differential between electrons and protons at the poles of the battery repelling and attracting electrons so that they move. So mechanism has different, it, it really can be described at different levels. And one of the um, implications of that is that as you start to describe mechanism at different levels, often what you talk about in terms of cause and effect changes what's actually considered the cause. Let me ask you to stop and think. I'm going to elaborate that statement in just a moment. But let me ask you to stop and take a moment to think about a mechanism in a topic that you teach and what a few different levels are that, that it can be talked about at. So I've given an, exam an example just now. See if you can come up with one from what you are teaching. These are some great responses coming into the chat. Tina, what do you think about some of these responses from the teachers? I think they're really interesting. And I think you know one of the things that I would ask people to think about is how, as you describe each of these, how, do they, how does the, the actual mechanism that you have in mind as an educator interact with what the kids might have in mind, so depending upon the age group. So, you know, talking about density and pressure, for example. Um, so maybe kids are thinking about crowdedness. Maybe they're thinking about um, the relationship between, you know, atomic mass and bonding, et cetera. So at what level are you asking them to think about mechanism? And this is something that, um, you know, you'll be grappling with as you teach these different topics. Um, it also interacts with how, how kids understand the science and how deep deeply. And what I'd like to show you is an example of how pattern and mechanism interact. And you'll see how understanding, I think, how seeing um, pattern, how seeing mechanism at different levels um, interacts with how deeply they understand the concept. So let me show you um, a slide and just think for a moment. You don't need to list these. You can just think about what your students would say. So this picks up on the density idea. Um, but think about what your students might say. when What is going on when an object sinks or floats? So I'm going to keep moving here, just to show it as an example. So here's an example where pattern and mechanism clearly interacts, the interact. So if a student thinks here that, that weight is the thing making it sink, as a student does, and they're reasoning about the weight, they often come away with a simple linear model of cause and effect. I drop the object in, the weight makes it sink. And so the mechanism and the pattern fit together here. Yet, if you're studying density, likely you want students to have a relational causality here. So you want them to realize that when you drop something into a liquid, the, it's the relationship between the density of the object, if it's an object, might be a liquid, might be two liquids, um, but it's the density of the object and the density of the liquid and the relationship between the two that causes the outcome. So again, if you're reasoning from a density-related mechanism, you're going to come up with a different pattern, a different causal pattern than if you're reasoning from 
um, a weight-based notion of a mechanism. And one of the, the implications that this has for instruction is that often we interact around patterns in ways that reinforce simple notions of mechanism. So it's very common in the early grades to see people talking about sinkers and floaters and attaching to the object the, the, the idea of mechanism, that the weight makes it sink and that it's about the object, instead of being about the relationship between the two things, the two, the, either the two liquids or the liquid and the object. And we often also see curriculum that's, you know, professional curriculum sometimes that reinforces this kind of idea. So the idea here is that as we think about mechanism, we also have to think about pattern and we need to think about the different levels at which we're describing mechanism to students or helping students engage with mechanism and how they're connecting that to, to the patterns. Um, so that, that um, one other thing about mechanism is that often for scientifically accepted models, you can have more than one mechanism that's accepted. So a buoyancy explanation or a density explanation in this case. I'm going to show you one other example of how pattern and mechanism interact. And this comes from work that we're doing with students on circuit electricity. So in the first model, it's a simple linear model, but there kids have a consumer source model of what's going on. They think about the mechanism as being energy moving down the wire to the bulb and um, making the bulb light. I have a lot of electrical cords that have been cut down the middle and then taped back together because we pull them apart to show the kids that it's a big circle. In the second example, where it's a double linear model, here, these are students who've often learned about static electricity. And so they have protons going up one side and electrons going up the other side, and they imagine that they clash in the bulb. So the mechanism here is an attraction between protons and electrons. And that's a very clever idea. It's not the scientifically, scientifically accepted model, but it's very clever. And it goes along with this double linear idea. The third model, the cyclic sequential model, is one we see often in elementary school. Here the students think of the circuit as being empty until electrons fill it. And then they come around and keep going to light the, um, the bulb. And then if, there's, if it's a series circuit with other bulbs along the way, those bulbs will light up, they think, later. Or maybe they won't be as bright, et cetera. And then there's two other models here, a cyclic simultaneous one where there's electrons all along the circuit and they actually start to flow and move um, when the battery is hooked up. And the last one, which is a differential model. But you can see in the student models above that how they think about pattern and the cause, so that the causal force involved um, are very much connected. Mm -hmm.